I'm very concerned about TikTok for a couple of reasons. Um, and I say this, actually, I, I watch TikTok, so I don't have TikTok on my devices, but TikTok is very popular for a reason. And it is very popular in the US. It's something like on, on in general, 40% of Americans, I think, are now on TikTok. And TikTok is increasingly their source of news. It's not just entertainment. But there are sort of two big concerns, national security concerns about TikTok. One is welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Such a pleasure. So today we'll be talking about your latest book, Spies, Lies, and Algorithms. I read it a couple of weeks ago. Absolutely loved it. Um, I guess perhaps we should maybe just start from, I guess, the basement up. And when you talk about intelligence, um, I guess let's just perhaps start definitionally. What are you referring to intelligence as and perhaps what is it not? Oh, such a good question. For, well, thanks so much for having me on. I'm delighted that you read and liked the book uh, and you're not required to read it for a course in order to graduate. So that's a special treat for me. <laughs> uh, intelligence, a lot of people think that intelligence is secrets, but it's not just secrets. So intelligence is any kind of information that gives a policymaker advantage. So if we think about how can policymakers in any country better understand threats over the horizon or opportunities for a trade deal or a nuclear arms deal, intelligence is supposed to give a country's leaders that what's called decision advantage. Now, what does that mean? What intelligence isn't? Intelligence isn't just secrets. 80% of a typical intelligence report in the United States comes from unclassified information, not classified stuff, although the secrets do matter. Intelligence also is not policy. So intelligence is supposed to say, Mr. President, we assess that China is likely to invade Taiwan by 2027, but the intelligence official cannot say, should not say, and therefore we recommend you do X, Y, and Z. Intelligence goes to policymakers, policymakers decide what to do about it. I think it's easy for people to kind of think about, um, I believe as you call it, spytainment. Um, yeah. You know, for instance, over, my 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 neck of the woods have got James Bond or kind of Johnny English and, and and all these things. So I wonder perhaps for the people listening, how different do you kind of think that those kind of uh the fictional um kind of movies and shows are from what actually goes on in real life? Well, the short answer is they're really different. I love spy themed entertainment, just like the next person. I joke, I was just in Washington and I joked with intelligence folks there, who doesn't like a movie where Congress always works, right? And the good guys always <laughs> win. Um, but what I found, and actually the reason I started writing this book was I was teaching in Los Angeles at UCLA, the Hollywood capital. And I asked my students, um, as you know from the book, um, what they knew about intelligence and where they got their information from. And I found in my surveys, they didn't know anything about intelligence. And what they did learn, they learned from the movies and from TV. And then I found that my students were who watched a lot of spy-themed entertainment were far more likely to approve of waterboarding and other really controversial interrogation techniques that the United States had used. That was really interesting to me. Then I did national polls and I found the same thing. And then the more I looked, the more I found that fictional spies were actually influencing public opinion in the United States and they were influencing real intelligence policy. So um, the best example I found was when Leon Panetta faced his confirmation hearing to be director of the Central Intelligence Agency members of the Senate actually asked him questions about a ticking time bomb scenario. You know, the terrorist is in custody. You think there's going to be a major attack in an American city. How, what, what interrogation techniques are you going to allow to be used to get the information out of him in time? The ticking time bomb scenario has never happened in real life. It is completely a Hollywood fiction. And here are members of the Senate asking the CIA director nominee about a plot line from the show 24, and he took it seriously. So a whole, uh, I have a bunch of other examples that are alarming about how 
um, soldiers on the front lines, Supreme Court justices, members of Congress are actually using fictional spies to make real intelligence policy because, of course, they watch the same television and movies that we do. So I guess a, a follow-up question to that would be perhaps why is it perhaps influencing people in this way? Do you have any idea perhaps why it is kind of swaying opinion towards perhaps being, as you said, more open towards kind of the the Guantanamo Bay kind of uh, uh, kind of torture methods, perhaps as you said, with the waterboarding. Why why would that be? Because I think when there's no when there isn't a good fact base, then myth rules the day. Right. Right. So you know, uh, one of the things I found is that most Americans don't have access to good facts about how intelligence actually operates. So political scientists like me typically don't write about intelligence topics because it's a really hard thing to do when you never know if you're going to get any information. <laughs> and because professors teach what they research, I found that most top universities in the United States don't offer courses on intelligence either. And so one of the things I tell my students is um, they're more likely if they're at a top 25 university to learn about U2 the band rather than U2 the spy plane because there are more courses on the history of rock and roll in American universities than there are in US intelligence. And then members of Congress, you can't, they don't know about intelligence easily unless they've worked in an intelligence agency before. But there are more people in Congress that are powdered milk experts because they come from farm districts than there are members of Congress who are intelligence experts because they worked in intelligence agencies before. So there's this lack of, information. And so when information isn't there, we gravitate to what we know. And what we know is what we see on the big screen and what we read and the video games we play. Right. We try to fill in the gaps ourselves. Um, one of the things that I loved from the book, and I have to say was, was one of my favorite parts, was you talked about the history of, uh, of the intelligence agencies. And there were some pretty incredible examples and I wonder if you could just kind of like talk about that because I, I found this part of the book really really captivating I would say. So I'm so glad you like that part of the book because if I could write another book today it would just be on the history of intelligence in the American Revolution because I find it fascinating. One of my favorite all-time examples is how French bread helped win the Revolutionary War. <laughs> and so George Washington, which many people don't know, was an avid spy master. He had a network of spies. He, he lost track of them. He forgot the code names, but he really used intelligence to avoid fighting battles that he knew he could lose. And so one of his great deceptions in the Revolutionary War was um, convincing the British that he was going to stay close to New York when, in fact, he was traveling south to Yorktown decisive battle. And how did he trick them? He created, he built French bake ovens. So French bread was a crucial food for the troops and the location of bake ovens was a really good indicator of where the troops were going to go. And so he went through this whole elaborate ruse to create these French bake ovens with, um, you know, hundreds of bricks and lots of troops around. And it was all a fake to convince the British he was staying put when actually his troops were marching south. So French bread helped win the Revolutionary War. That's really an incredible story. Um, in the book, you kind of talk about these five mores um, and you go through perhaps the emergence of new technology. And it kind of seems to be this sort of transition period that we're in. Um, so in terms of this kind of... Um, this this kind of perhaps new era that we're entering, this new emergence of technology, AI. Um, you kind of go go through quite a um, uh, a pretty deep list in the book of things that are kind of um, that are altering this this pace. Um, I wonder if you could kind of perhaps talk about the the benefits and perhaps the risks involved in this kind of uh, this new era. I guess that we're kind of going into, driven by technology. Yeah, so I started off writing a different book than I ended up writing. I started off wanting to write Intelligence 101, sort of the basics of intelligence to sort of combat this Hollywood effect. And what happened was I took so long to write the book that the world changed. And so the technology piece of it is, I think, one of the most important parts of the book. 
So we're in this revolutionary moment where emerging technologies from internet connectivity, who would have ever thought two thirds of the world, two thirds of the world would be online. We have internet connectivity, AI, quantum computing, commercial satellite uh, capabilities that we could never have dreamed of in the past. All these things are happening at the same time. Uh, and they're creating fundamental challenges. If you think about intelligence as a business, the business of intelligence is insight. And that business is getting radically disrupted by all these technologies. So there's good news and there's bad news, right? The good news is now there are more people, anyone with a cell phone or an internet connection can collect intelligence and analyze intelligence and disseminate intelligence. And we can see this, <clears throat> excuse me, we can see this with the war in Ukraine. Lots of great analysis about troop movements and what's happening posted on Twitter, for example. Commercial satellite imagery being used by journalists to identify specific troop movements on the battlefield. Who could have ever imagined that a decade ago? So that what that means is that there are more smart people all over the world putting their talents to identifying problems and threats in the world what's going on with nuclear weapons programs around the world. And there are really smart people that are discovering things with publicly available information. So that's the good news. The bad news is anyone can do it. That means adversaries can do it. It means they can deceive at scale because it's open to everyone. And it means that spy agencies in major countries like um, the UK and the United States are losing their relative advantage. They no longer are dominating the collection and analysis of information. They've got a lot of competition, which means that weak countries or non-state actors like terrorist groups can use the same capabilities to their advantage as well. And so one example I, I often give is when Iran sent missile strikes against US troops in Iraq and wounded 100 people, they use commercial satellite imagery. They didn't need to launch a billion dollar spy satellite to target those missiles. They use commercially available satellites to do that. Right. So clearly it's kind of, there's been this decentralizing process which has gone on. And I was actually following um, the kind of, uh, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine from over here. And one of the things that I was staggered by was kind of following along on Twitter was that I, I was able to pretty much know from us reporting when russia were going to invade almost down to the hour in fact maybe it was down to the hour it was it was pretty exact i mean before these things actually happened do you view that as kind of a a, a big success of this kind of of the um of the intelligence agencies it was mostly a big success right the part that u.s intelligence agencies didn't get right was um, over, overestimating Russian military capabilities, underestimating Ukrainian military capabilities and the will to fight. So the expectation was there was going to be invasion, it was going to be fast, it was going to be over. And so US intelligence agencies didn't get that part right, but they did get right that Putin intended to invade and when he intended to invade. And as you might remember, even Zelensky didn't believe the intelligence, right? So this is a remarkable intelligence success. And it was also a remarkable change for US intelligence agencies, because normally there's advantage that comes from concealing intelligence, not revealing intelligence. And so this was a deliberate strategy, a pretty bold strategy by the Biden administration to declassify this intelligence in real time about what the Russians were doing to warn the world and try to prevent the invasion, but also to rally the allies and to make it more difficult for Putin to operate. One of the things that perhaps is really kind of, in my mind, boost onto the scene, particularly when uh, the social network um, with Tristan Harris come around was kind of this talk about data and for instance, big tech. So I would love to know, um, compared to, for instance, the CIA, um, or here in Britain, GCHQ or, or MI6, um, how powerful are people like Google or Amazon or Microsoft in terms of the data that they they truly must have on me and, and our listeners, I would imagine? Well, they're incredibly powerful, not just because of the data that they collect about users around the world, but the compute power they bring, the AI capabilities, the talent they're hiring, 
I mean, more and more AI professors in universities are going to the private sector, which means you can't train the next generation in AI if they're all working for companies. So right. they will they wield a tremendous amount of power. And so I often say that we're in the position now where U.S. government agencies need technological capabilities they don't have, and private sector companies like Google and Facebook have responsibilities that they don't want, right? So they're trying to decide what speech is allowed and what isn't and how to combat Russian election interference. And to whoever thought Mark Zuckerberg would create a company and that would be his biggest concern, right? Russian election interference on Facebook. So it's it's a very difficult moment for these big companies. Um, one which I would love to get your opinion on, and I have to say, I have to confess to you, that back in March 2020 to about well, June 2020, I was totally hooked on TikTok. I mean, completely and utterly hooked. At the time, I was I was saying to my friends, you have to get on this app. It's unbelievable. Um, people tell me that that is quite a um a data collection, a data collecting machine. Are you concerned at all about TikTok? I'm very concerned about TikTok for a couple of reasons. Um, and I say this, actually, I, I watch TikTok, so I don't have TikTok on my devices, but TikTok is very popular for a reason. And it is very popular in the US. It's something like on, on in general, 40% of Americans, I think, are now on TikTok. And TikTok is increasingly their source of news. It's not just entertainment. But there are sort of two big concerns, national security concerns about TikTok. One is what data is the Chinese company that owns TikTok, ByteDance, what data are they collecting on users? Um, because they can be compelled by the Chinese government to turn that data over, right? Um, and then um, the second is how could TikTok be used to influence the attitudes of its users in some pretty surreptitious ways? It doesn't have to be you know, don't believe this presidential candidate legitimately won the election. It could be something as simple as um, portraying China in a much more positive light, right, than we might think. Um, spreading disinformation about the Uyghurs, for example, or the Chinese Communist Party's detention of the Uyghurs. And so this, it's a mechanism for influence. So if we think about the Russian playbook, in 2016 was use American tech platforms against, uh, against Americans. The Chinese playbook could be, they don't even need American tech platforms, they've got their own. So that's the real concern. And that's being played out right now in discussions between the US government and ByteDance about how to mitigate both of those, both of those threats. Didn't Donald Trump, did he try to ban it? I seem to remember. He, he, he did. did try to ban it. And I think what we're headed towards, and, and he was right to be concerned. This is a concern that is a bipartisan concern in the United States. Republicans and Democrats don't agree on much, but they do agree on TikTok. <laughs> and so there's now, there's now a real discussion about can the company have a U.S. subsidiary that is walled off from that Chinese um, interference or collection of the data uh, and the influence of what users are seeing. Yeah, um, what interests me about there is, as you obviously with the CCP, they have kind of limits to their speech. So I would imagine that if I went to China and I was on their TikTok, I, unlike perhaps in the here in the UK or in the US, where I'm seeing kind of, as you said, this perhaps swayful content, I'd probably be seeing gifted Chinese mathematicians or brilliant Chinese concert pianists or uh, people speaking glowingly of the government, or am I just perhaps being conspiratorial, or is that no, possible? Not, no, you're absolutely right. And so, you know, you're not allowed to criticize the leader, Xi Jinping. You're not allowed to criticize the Chinese Communist Party. You're not allowed on any social media in China to even mention the date June 4th, which is when the Tiananmen massacre occurred. And so, Chinese citizens, you know, find clever ways around these things. They talk about um, May 35th, right, which is June 4th. Um, Winnie the Pooh is often used as a substitute for Xi Jinping. So it is a tightly controlled, censored environment with legions of censors monitoring what is put on social media, who can say what, and if you're found in violation, your life is not good. So there is no freedom of speech 
in China today like there is in the US. So you're absolutely right that if you were watching TikTok in China, you would get no criticism of the Chinese Communist Party. And you'd in fact get glowing uh, you know, content about how wonderful life is under the Chinese Communist Party. Right, a re real kind of propaganda machine. Um, when I was kind of reading your book, it actually took me back to a conversation that I had um, with uh, Neil Ferguson, who I believe is also from the, is he also from the Hoover He's Institute? He's a colleague of mine here, yeah. I believe, and a great He's right man. right down the hall. Oh, a great man, I have to say. And um, yeah, I uh, a conversation I had with him, and after he released his book, uh, Doom, I um, I kind of asked him, I said to him, you know, in the future, where do you foresee perhaps the next um, potential disaster could be? And uh, he, he listed off a couple, and towards the end of it, he said, Maybe it could even be a, a cyber attack. And um, kind of this, I guess, fits nicely into your work. But one of the interesting things for that is for me living in Britain or for you living in the US, we've pretty much had geography on our advantage in the sense that we're an island that could perhaps protect us. But in a cyber attack, that would obviously negate that. Uh, how prepared do you think that perhaps the, the Western world in that sense would be for a cyber attack? Well, I think you've hit on such a key factor in cyber, which is that we don't have the blessing of good geography, right? We're all in bad cyber neighborhoods and there's no way around that. And that's one of the key differences in cyberspace that we don't have in physical space. But I'd say the other key difference is our freedom of speech in both of our countries makes us particularly vulnerable to mass deception. So what is a cyber attack? Lots of different flavors of cyber attacks, right? There's theft of intellectual property, there's ransomware, there's espionage. But the one variant that I think really caught US leaders by surprise was hacking our minds, not hacking our machines. So we have to worry about both of those threats. And the one that I think is much harder to defend against is the hacking of our minds. We look at the polarization of societies in both of our countries. And then you think about, you layer on to that cyber influence operations by countries like Russia and mm. China to try to pull us apart even more. Democracies are uniquely vulnerable to those kinds of efforts because we allow so much freedom of speech and they're undermining or pulling apart the fabric of our democratic societies. And I really worry about that. Right. And this is a point that I would actually love to kind of speak to you about, because obviously in recent months, Elon has taken over Twitter and uh, he seems to have really um, come out as a real, seems like a real free speech absolutist. And I mean, he's kind of come out and even just in recent weeks, I saw that he said he was going to kind of leak Fauci files and kind of all this, this other stuff that I was um, kind of uh, that he did even in recent weeks where he was kind of expose this link between I think it was the FBI and Twitter during COVID and he leaked these things to, to kind of individual journalists. Um, is that potentially a concern um, in terms of, you know, because one of the themes in your book was this kind of line between um, democracy and, and intelligence. That was one of the themes that I've got. So I wonder with Elon coming in, is that something that perhaps intelligence agencies might be a little bit worried about at all? I don't know that intelligence agencies are worried about it, but policymakers certainly are. So, you know, with Elon and Twitter, freedom of speech is not the same thing as freedom of reach, right? So he's got the megaphone and he's now not just owning the platform, but he's using the megaphone of the platform to spew all sorts of ideas, many of which have no basis in fact. So maybe some of them do, but a lot of them don't. So what do we do when one person controls that kind of megaphone? Or by the way, Starlink, what do we do if Elon changes his mind in a particular conflict about whether Starlink will be available or not? So we're living in a moment where so much power is being aggregated by individuals that are not accountable to voters, that aren't even accountable to a lot of shareholders, right? <laughs> These days with the voting um, rules of different companies. And that is problematic. So, you know, what does free speech mean? Free speech means the government can't infringe on your rights, but it doesn't mean um, that anything goes and that conspiracy theories uh, can spread like wildfire. So finding the right balance between letting speech go, but not letting it get amplified is I think a real 
it is a real challenge. And I think one of the things that we haven't thought enough about is it's not a question of do you censor or not censor, that if we just put the pause button on Twitter, for example, so rather than putting everything out there and then saying, oh, wait, we're going to try to roll this back or take people off, the default is we don't let things post right away if, they're, if we're, there's real concern that it is wild misinformation. That pushing the pause button or little nudges, like I'm sure you see this on Twitter, have you read this article before you want to retweet it? Those are very useful interventions. And we're not in the censor or no censor world. We're just in the nudging people to think a little bit more before they just type and post. There's a couple of things that I would kind of um, perhaps just like love to pick up with you um, just about. We've kind of just talked a little bit about, um, for instance, social media. And one of the things that going through your book that I was really interested in is it seems that we're constantly learning things all the time. And I can't remember if I read it in your book or I heard you talk about it, but you talked about how even in terms of the Cuban Missile Crisis, that this we're still learning about that today. Um, so obviously, very popular example was the 2016 election with Russian collusion. Um, do you think that there will be more to come out from that in latter years? And I wonder also, do we know if in 2020 there was also anything kind of similar that went on there? So I think we are going to get more information that's going to come out about 2016. So just in the past week, there was a very um, surprising arrest of a senior FBI counterintelligence official in the New York office who was involved in a number of these activities in 2016. Will we ever get to the bottom of what happened in 2016? Maybe not. But undoubtedly, there's more information that will come up in the over time. And you're right, we are still learning about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and it's been more than six decades. So the past is never really past, right? We're always learning new things. Um, I'd like to think that ultimately we'll get to the bottom of 2016. Uh, but I don't know that we will. As for you know what's happened in 2020, what I do know from my conversations with folks in Washington is that um, there was a much more concerted effort after 2016 to have cyber defenses be much more active at taking down the Internet Research Agency, for example. So really um, removing that active Russian interference. And that organization, that capability um, was involved in 2018, 2020, and 2022. So U.S. cyber defenses are getting much better than they were in 2016. But of course, the adversary never sleeps. And so you're going to see a cat and mouse game of cybersecurity for the foreseeable future. So in that sense, this is always an ongoing battle. Yeah, there's always... Anybody makes an advance on one side, there's going to be a counter advance on the other side. So we're never going to win the cyber war. We'll just fight battle after battle. How do you think that the perhaps the U.S. is actually adapting to this new era? These are, as you talked about in the book, the, these five mores. How, how would you uh, kind of surmise how they're doing? So I think, you know, there are 18 agencies uh, in the U.S. intelligence community. I think people are always surprised to find out there are that many. And I think for the most part, they're changing pretty fast. But the question is, are they changing fast enough? And the answer is no, they're not changing nearly fast enough. And so, the, you know, there are more threats, right? There's more speed of threats. There's more data. There are more customers who need intelligence who don't have security clearances like those tech leaders or voters, and they're more competitors today. So my, you know, I'm really concerned that this open source intelligence revolution, this publicly available information, means that if the US intelligence community can't harness the insights from all this data that's widely available, they will not get, be able to give that decision advantage to policymakers in the future like they have in the past. So I think this is an urgent moment that requires dramatic changes to intelligence. So we've had 20 years of fighting the global war on terror. Now the U.S. intelligence community is reorienting toward great power competition against Russia and China. At the same time, we have all of these emerging technologies that are disrupting the intelligence business. So this is a massive moment of reckoning for U.S. intelligence agencies. 
Yeah, that's that's a really, really well said. And I would love to kind of ask you just a couple of questions, um, because we've been talking about your latest book, Spies, Lies and Algorithms. Um, when I was kind of researching you, one of your previous books, Spy and Blind, really caught my my attention. And I would just have to ask, were you at all worried about writing that book? <laughs> Boy, was I. <laughs> yes, I was. So that book was five years it took to write that book. And I started writing it on 9-11. So, you know, you ask people where they were on 9-11, Americans can tell you exactly where they were. And uh, I remember watching the World Trade Center towers collapse. And I knew that day, because I had written about the CIA before and studied the CIA, that this was going to be an event that I would be studying for the rest of my life. I spent five years on this book looking at why the CIA and the FBI failed in the 10 years between the end of the Cold War and the 9-11 attacks. And there was a lot that came out about what happened in the run-up to 9-11, but no one had looked at why. And, and I found that they understood the terrorist threat, but they couldn't adapt fast enough to have a, a winning chance at stopping it. And I also discovered 23 different opportunities, 23 that the CIA and the FBI had in the weeks and months before that attack to penetrate that plot and possibly stop the clock. And they failed in all 23. Now, you asked about, was it you know hard to write that book? Was it difficult? Yeah, I had to hire a First Amendment lawyer wow. when, in the course of writing that book because intelligence agencies, it turns out, don't always like when you make public their failures. <laughs> uh, and so I asked a lot of uncomfortable questions uh, and I got really concerned in the course of writing the book, both about uh, how uh, certain uh, folks at the CIA were being dealt with after they had talked to me, getting polygraphed and interrogated for talking to me. And I was very concerned about a conversation I had with a very senior FBI official um, who um, made it very clear he was very unhappy with what I was doing. So it took a First Amendment lawyer to help guide me through this process. Uh, and I'm really glad, uh, I'm really glad I had him. <laughs> so you'll see a, a long acknowledgement of him in the acknowledgement sections of the book, because uh, other professors and, and scholars who have tried to publish things about failures like um, Pearl Harbor uh, found that, um, you know, they were prevented from doing so. Uh, and it took, in this case, Roberta Wolstetter, who wrote the classic book on Pearl Harbor and what went wrong, she fought for five years uh, and finally won. Um, so I'm really grateful to my lawyer. Wow, that, that will be the next one of your books that I, I, I check out. But I'd love to know just kind of from the 23 that you mentioned, were there any in particular that you think are perhaps really worth highlighting about perhaps where intelligence is not at its best? Yeah, so there are two that really come to mind. And what I found in that book was that individuals did not screw up. The organizations were not were not structured, they weren't designed, they didn't have the right cultures to be able to take advantage of these opportunities. So I'll give you one of those two examples. Please. So 19 days before 9-11, the FBI is finally told by the CIA after a year and a half that there are two suspected Al-Qaeda operatives that they believe are in the United States and they need to be found. And these two guys are named Khalid al-Madar and Nawaf al-Hazmi. They end up flying American Airlines 77 into the Pentagon on 9-11. And we now know that they came to the US, they lived in San Diego, they used their real names on their ID cards, on their rental agreements. One of them was listed in the telephone directory. And we now know that they made contact with several informants of then uh, past and ongoing FBI counterterrorism investigations. None of this was known to the FBI before 9-11. So 19 days before 9-11, the FBI gets word, these two guys are probably in the US and they need to be found. So there's a manhunt. What happens to the manhunt? Well, the FBI assigns a nationwide manhunt to one of its 56 offices in the United States, just one in New York. They give it the lowest level of priority and they assign it to a guy who had just finished his rookie year and had never led this kind of investigation before. So you think, how on earth could they have screwed this up so badly? Right. Well, it turns out that the FBI was designed to behave that way. So 
all cases were assigned only to one office in the FBI because it was a crime fighting organization, not an intelligence organization. And so that's how things were always handled. You give the lead to one office. So a nationwide manhunt was never going to be nationwide because that's how crimes were solved within the local office. Why was it labeled routine? Because in the FBI, all intelligence investigations are lower priority than criminal investigations. The FBI is a crime fighting organization. They'd like to look at crimes that have already been committed and bring the perps to justice. Intelligence is about stopping something bad in the future from happening in the first place. So all of that future oriented work was given lower priority. And why was it given to this rookie agent? Because it was the least desirable job. So it went to the most junior agent. FBI special agents are rewarded for conviction. So their incentives, right, are to focus on crime. So the structure of the Bureau led to one office. The culture of the Bureau downgraded the manhunt. And the incentives of individual special agents meant that you were going to give the most, what turned out to be the most important task to the least experienced guy in the squad. So it was doomed to fail to stop the manhunt um, 19 days before 9-11. And was that a catalyst in the years that followed for a real, perhaps, transformation? Was there some, perhaps, benefit that actually did come out of that event? I mean, the, the intelligence community was reformed in some pretty major ways after 9-11. Um, the real tragedy is it should have been reformed before 9-11, and I found a lot of evidence to suggest that leaders knew it needed to be reformed and tried desperately to get those reforms and failed in the 10 years before the September 11th attacks. But there's no question that intelligence and counterterrorism got much better after 9-11 than before. You know, if we had had this conversation on September 12th, 2001, and we had said, you know, what do you think the odds are that there would be 20 years and no similar catastrophic terrorist attack would happen on U.S. soil, I wouldn't have believed it, right? But here we are. And in fact, intelligence has had remarkable success since 9-11 at stopping catastrophic terrorist attack around the world, not just in the United States. So there was good that came out of it, but it came out of tragedy. And I can tell you in talking to a lot of intelligence officials who were working on 9-11, they are haunted by that day, every day of their lives. They feel that failure every day. What happened at um, Iran's industrial shed in uh, 2020? I wonder if you could share this with us because I thought this was pretty incredible. It's, we have like a mind when you're picking out my favorite bits of the book. I'm so <laughs> glad you asked about that. So I'm finishing writing the book and it's the July 4th weekend, our independence holiday. And, um, uh, I'm watching this event happen in real time. So what happens is on July 2nd, there is a fire in Iran and the flames are so bright, they're detected by a weather satellite in space. And Iran comes out uh, and says very quickly, pay no attention to the fire. This is a so-called industrial shed under construction and it's an insignificant fire with really limited damage. Now, of course, Tehran was lying. Um, <laughs> So these two researchers who don't have security clearances, don't work for the US government, um, their names are David Albright and Fabian Hines. They work in different organizations. They see on social media that there's this weather satellite that detected this fire and they start researching. Now they're non-proliferation experts. They quickly geolocate the building and they realize the so-called industrial shed is a nuclear centrifuge assembly facility at Natanz, one of the main <laughs> sites of Iran's <laughs> nuclear weapons program. And then they use commercial satellite imagery and they discover that it's not a small fire, it's a large fire, possibly caused by an explosion, possibly the result of sabotage. So they go on Twitter and they post their analyses independently within hours of the shed fire uh, being detected by the satellite. The American media picks it up. The New York Times runs a big story by that afternoon citing their analysis. And by nightfall, then Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who's now again Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, is asked in a press conference, did Israel sabotage this facility in Iran? This is a remarkable event. Right. In the course of one business day, we get 
um, this change of this analysis and this question to a senior policymaker. And all of this happened without any classified information. And all of it happened outside US intelligence agencies. So when I talk about this sort of open source intelligence revolution and what it means, this example of the shed fire over July 4th weekend in 2020 is I think one of the best examples. Just as a very like minor example, there was like a football game here, and, and a fan kicked the player, and it, like there was so many like videos and like fo uh, photographs, and within like seconds, like people had this guy's face, people had like tracked him down. It's it's really scary, like the internet's ability to detect this. So clearly, this is like one of those things where this is a, uh, it's like a double-edged sword that this can be incredible, and there's also the danger to it, right? Yeah, I mean, I always say it's the wisdom of the crowd and the danger of the mob. There's a very thin line between those two things. Right, right. How do intelligence agencies, how do they think about, for instance, ethics? Um, that would be something I'd be interested to kind of get your thoughts on. So this is one of the questions I asked to a number of intelligence officials. So one of the things that I thought was going to be really important about this book compared to my other books is I wanted intelligence officials' voices to come through. I wanted to kind of lift the veil and let readers get a sense of what is it like to be them? Mm. What do they tell their kids, right? What's their best and worst moment? And I asked this question about ethics. How do you think about ethical dilemmas? And I was fascinated by the answers. So what I found was that there aren't really systematic programs to train ethics, but that the individuals that I interviewed, and they come from a variety of different agencies and different positions, think deeply about ethics every day. So whether to collect, continue collecting, say eavesdropping on someone's conversation, that is an ethical decision. How to protect a human source and their family, and what are you willing to do to protect them? How far are you willing to go? Those involve ethical decisions. And so... Um, I found that intelligence officers think a lot about ethics um, and they are they they face real dilemmas, right? So, um, and there's a wonderful book by a former counterintelligence officer um, named James Olson that actually gives, you know, 50 or more specific scenarios sort of ripped from the headlines or ripped from the real world about what would you do if. And he has different people from religious figures to intelligence uh, officers to university professors weigh in on how they would decide these things. But the point is that, that the intelligence community, uh, uh, people in the IC think a lot about ethics. They may not come out where you would come out on a particular issue, but they don't cavalierly go about the decisions that they make. Right, right. That's super interesting. It's super interesting to know how, um, I guess, they kind of make their decisions. Um, one which came up over and over again uh, that people have kind of mentioned in terms of this space, in terms of perhaps ethical dilemmas that have arisen, but perhaps from the other side, would be in recent years, um, there's been two pretty high profile cases of Edward Snowden and Julian Assange. Um, do you have perhaps any sympathy there or do you feel like perhaps that the the right actions were taken so to speak so i recognize that there are very strong opinions on both sides for both of these cases and i teach a class based on the book at stanford and i can tell you that i think the prevailing opinion on at least on this university campus is that edward snowden was a hero because mm. he revealed these classified programs that were deeply disturbing to many people that is not my view. I want to make sure that you know my students actually hear the most compelling arguments on both sides of that debate because it's important that they come to their own decision. But I will say, you know, I think at least in the Snowden case, there's pretty compelling evidence um, that he was a traitor, not a hero. That um, some of these programs did go too far. They, you know, and we see that you know in one case with the NSA's 215 program, which was the metadata program, was changed. Uh, Congress actually changed the law and the program was changed because there was a feeling that it wasn't really aligned with American values and American public sentiment. But, you know, there's no question in my mind, based on the evidence I've seen, that Snowden did more than just gather information that concerned him about privacy. 
He manipulated his co-workers to revealing information that was deeply harmful to the national security of the United States and our friends and allies around the world. And what did he do after he did it? He went to Hong Kong and then Moscow. Uh, you know, I think if he really felt like he uh, wanted to uh, see the light of day and air his grievances, he could have exercised his rights under the whistleblower laws that we have. He didn't do that. He could have talked to the congressional oversight committees. He didn't do that. Uh, and he could come back to the United States to stand trial for the crimes that he's been accused of. And he hasn't done that either. Yeah, there's, that one is one which um, the people you speak to, that one seems to be a very, very polarized issue. Right. But I do recognize that there is a there are very strong sentiments on the other side of that debate. I will share with you, soon after he left the United States for Hong Kong, I did a speaker series at Stanford where we wanted to have one night of, of the series devoted to one particular perspective. So we had um, one of the reporters who covered, who you know did the Snowden revelations in the Washington Post, Bart Gelman, we had a whole night about his perspective. And I um, hosted a night with then General Mike Hayden, who was the former head of the National Security Agency, whose programs were revealed by Snowden, and the former head of the CIA. And I asked General Hayden if you could say or ask Edward Snowden anything if he were here tonight, what would you say? And without missing a beat, he said, I'd say you have the right to remain silent. <laughs> Very strong views Very strong about views. Edward Snowden. What about Assange? I mean, Assange is a bit trickier, right? Mm. Because he revealed information to WikiLeaks and then there are all these other charges against him that are disturbing as well that right. have nothing yeah. to do with classified information. Um, so I think there's... It's a little bit different. He's also not, he also didn't take an oath to protect the Constitution. He didn't sign an agreement to protect classified information. So I think there are some important differences there. But, you know, let's be clear it's not just when you release classified information to the world, you know, you wipe your hands and you're not culpable. These are real people whose lives are at stake, um, whose sources are compromised, uh, and it can do real harm. So I think especially in light of the recent um, news stories about how lax both our Democratic president and our former Republican president have been with classified materials, there's a sense of like, oh, I guess it doesn't really matter very much. Well, it actually really does matter. People's lives are at stake. Uh, and so I think there's, you know, I, I'm, I'm no fan of Julian Assange, but I do see the differences in his case to Edward Snowden. Sure. Yeah, I thought that was very well said. Uh, one of the kind of last questions I would love to uh, touch on with you another uh, uh, audience question is and of course I don't want to try to make people paranoid you but this is genuine question which a lot of people people have asked me um, in terms of the intelligence one um, devices like Alexa or um, even cell phones or uh, computer um, the, the, the cameras at the top of computer screens are these things that we should perhaps be concerned about at all we should be concerned about them, but perhaps not for all the reasons that some of your listeners may be concerned about them. So there are very strict rules governing what the National Security Agency can do, for example. So NSA is not eavesdropping your conversation with your grandma, right? It's just that they are not allowed to do that. And if they do, they if they would do it, and they have done it in, in you know previous decades, they get in big trouble. So there are very tight rules governing that kind of collection. But I don't have Alexa in my house. I cover up my camera because there's cyber vulnerabilities, right? All sorts of, they're attack vectors right into my data, right into my life by all sorts of different actors. So I'm not concerned that the U.S. government is going to overstep its bounds. I know other people are, but we do have a court system. We have congressional overseers. We have executive branch oversight that tightly monitors what they're doing. And if they overstep their bounds, they are held to account. I am much more worried about the nefarious actors in the US and abroad that are using those devices or spyware on my phone, the spyware for hire. We've seen a lot of articles about these Israeli companies that are marketing spyware to more than a hundred countries around the world. And they're using spyware to track dissidents and political opponents, not just to fight terrorism or crime. So I'm worried about that, right? And so I think your listeners should be a little paranoid. Uh, they shouldn't uh, download TikTok on their phones and they, you might not wanna have Alexa in your house listening to everything you're doing. 
<laughs> I have to say I was very uh perhaps liberal when it came to this matter. And I was I was I thought, nah, this is this is nothing. I I you know, and I wasn't paranoid at all. You know, on, on the one extreme side, you had people saying, you know, you get the vaccine and Bill Gates will know where you go in and you'll have these crazy chips and, and you shouldn't uh do do uh, have Alexa and things. But I was kind of very much of the opposite. Uh, we, uh, but one of my co- my co-hosts he interviewed um, Andrew Bush de Monte. Um, I'm not sure if you were if you're aware of him. He was a CIA spy. Um, I think he's recently you now come into the public light. He may have maybe even written a book. And I listened to the conversation that they had, and I thought, oh wow, you know, maybe I actually perhaps should be more concerned than I actually am, and particularly kind of like going through your work and, and in particular TikTok, which was something that came up today. That certainly see, does seem like an actual cause for concern. Well, I, you know, I didn't mention, I mentioned two vulnerabilities mm. in TikTok, which were the sort of data gathering and influence. The third is just cyber weaknesses, mm. right? So can TikTok be used by other actors to get into your systems and do you know bad things, whether it's stealing or, or you know, ransomware or um, monitoring what you're doing? Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And I love um, I love chatting with you. I, I absolutely love the book. We're going to put a link below uh, to Amazon where our audience can pick up a copy and we link to your social media. Um, is there anything at all today that we, we haven't discussed that you would love to share with our audience? Thoughts that you've had or perhaps any work that you'd like to send our audience to or check out? Oh, well, thanks so much for just a really fun conversation, picking out my favorite little tidbits from the book. If if folks want to know more about sort of how I'm thinking about intelligence challenges now um, with the war in Ukraine, I have a piece out in this issue, the current issue of Foreign Affairs Magazine. So if they want to learn more, that's a good and shorter place to to read it. We will um, put a link below. Where can, oh, guys, where can they connect with you? Uh, So I'm I'm on Twitter. Uh, and if they have comments or questions, they want to email me. It's just zegert at stanford.edu, Z-E-G-A-R-T at stanford.edu. Amazing. Well, Amy, thank you so much for, for coming on. Thank you for writing a brilliant book. Um, I will keep an eye and I will check out your um, your previous book on um, 9-11, which I, I'm very interested in. And um, I would perhaps love to do it again in the future. I'll keep an eye out for your future work. And uh, yeah, Thanks thank so you so much. much for coming on. I would love to do it again. It was so much fun. Thanks for having me.